Welcome back to Worth the Effort Woodworking and Tool Fool Friday, a weekly little episode I do to discuss a tool that I deem indispensable in my personal shop. This week, we're going to talk about grinders, but I'm going to refine that down into grinders for turning. So yeah, I'm going to teach you how to sharpen those turning tools. Real quickly, I'm going to start out and just explain what I have right here. Uh, when Dad and I combined our shops, uh, we kind of combined our sharpening stabs, and I built this table. I'm not really happy with it, so we're going to be doing something different in the next few weeks, but for this video, it'll work out just fine. When I came into the shop, I basically had three eight inch grinders and one six inch grinder. Uh, I had one uh, eight inch grinder, a Delta that I bought when I first started out when I didn't really know what I was buying and I bought a regular grinder. If you're a wood turner, you really want to get a slow speed grinder. I think this, uh, the RPM is like 1700, 1800 RPM, somewhere in there. Most uh, grinders are built for the metal working and they spend a lot faster. Uh, I have that eight inch, other eight inch grinder up on the shelf just as a backup, just in case, uh, but it just goes way too fast for what I want to do. Uh, Dad also had a, um, an eight inch grinder and all of ours were bought uh, at sales at different woodworking shops, uh, excuse me, two, one of mine was bought at a woodcraft store when they had on sale and dad bought the same exact model when he was in uh, Wisconsin because a lot of wood turners bought them that year because they were less than a hundred bucks. I picked up a second one at my shop at a estate sale. Dad also has a jet slow speed storm, storm kind of a knockoff of the Tormac. Uh, it, it doesn't work anymore. I know it's repairable, but we just don't use that kind of sharpening gear, so I just haven't gotten around to it. Uh, one of the eight inch grinders I had brought in crapped out on us, so that's why we have different brands t this time. Both Dad and I had a one-way Wolverine setup. I actually had two for my two grinders, so we ended up with three, so a lot of these parts are redundant as we kind of combined them, but that's beside the point. We'll get to those in a second. As per stones, in my shop, I was using the less expensive uh, friable wheels. Dad had a uh, one of these where he had these two uh, wheels on it. This one's a fairly coarse one. I'm not actually sure what the grid is. This one, I believe he says is 180, but it's, it's over 10 years old, it's worn down, so it's probably a little bit finer, but even that, it works really well. I purchased this, this uh, this wheel at the latest SWAT, and it is a 600 grit wheel, I believe. At this point, I got this one because of other tools. I, I thought it would work with my hand tools. I'm kind of wishing I got 320, and I'll explain why later on. But the results I get on this as far as the, the cutting on the wood, phenomenal. On the small six inch grinder, I'm still using a friable wheel. It is a 36 grit and I love that one. I've talked about that in past videos uh, and I'll put a link down to those down below. But this video, we are basically going to focus on the eight inchers for the wood turning. Now you will notice the di di diamond wheels, I've removed the guards on them because you don't really need them for the diamonds. The friable wheels, uh, the white ones, the gray ones, the green ones, all those kind of stuff you do because they will explode in certain situations or just randomly sometimes. They can be very somewhat dangerous there. Another reason why we are slowly replacing all of them. Plus the fact that uh, with the better steels that we are getting nowadays that just weren't available 10 years ago, you're just getting a better surface with diamonds versus those old friable ones. Some of the, fri the steels are barely cut by the friables. Both Dad and I had the one-way Wolverine setup. I'm going to tell you here and now, if you're getting into wood turning, just buy it. It's a hundred bucks. You get two of these platforms, one for each side of the wheel. You also get a bar like this to help you with jigs. I'll show you how you can use this later on. And you get a platform. And the platform is a key thing to me. These platforms 
are wonderful. They take a beating. They don't flex on you. They just they just work and you don't have to think about it. I have had so many different platforms in my career that are flimsy. For example, this one from Veritas, which is highly recommended. And if you, you look at it, you can see I've been using it for a long time. But you, this is pretty solid for this style and it's kind of wiggly. The adjustments, I mean, it's not rock solid. Those And those ones that come with your grinders that are attached here, those are horrible. I spent about as much for this one platform as that entire Wolverine setup. And the thing is, these have become so, somewhat so standard in the professional wood turning realm that people make accessories that go with them. I mean, you can buy alternative platforms so that you can use different jigs. These are all things that dad's collected over the years to make certain different cuts, uh, grinds a little bit easier. You can spend a lot of money on these jigs. And I think that's why a lot of times this gets a bad rap because there's a lot of people that make things that will go with this one. You don't have to buy all that junk. If you want to, go ahead, but there are other ways you can do the basic stuff with just this setup. The only accessory I actually have ever used is these little Vera grind jigs. And I, I'd seek out the older model, not the newer model. It's a little bit different design. This is about 60, maybe $70 on Amazon, I think. Now, one of the things a lot of people stress about is getting their platform set up so that they get the proper angle on their cutting edges. And there's a couple of different ways you, you can do it. If you want to be cheap, basically you can just kind of trial and error it with maybe a tool that you like. You come over here, you set it up, you want to get it just right so you play around with it. And then once you get it set just perfectly, maybe go get a piece of thin plywood or something like that. Have it straight here and then draw the angle right there so that you, anytime you want to come back to this one setting for this tool, you just put the plywood up to it. If you don't want to do that DIY, there are a lot of companies that make really cool jigs. I personally really like this Raptor. This is one that dad bought. I got something from Stuart Batty design back when he, he was marketing them. I think he sold this design to somebody else. And this thing right here has all these different angles on it and you can do it to set it up. I did not like this one, but dad loves it. He doesn't like these, but I like this. This right here is about $12. You buy that little set for $12. Again, you can make it. And how this thing works is I have a little lip on the edge. I can drop that down on the platform. I just need to move my platform up to the distance I want from the wheel and then change the angle until both of those tips touch and then lock everything down. And I can return to the setting time and time again by just doing those two. But I will say, I use this 40 degrees so often that I bought myself an extra platform. And this is one I never touch. I've got it labeled 40 degrees for a lot of the turning stuff I do. So I can put my finger right on that line. I drop it in here. And I know that this one is going to be set the same every single time. The distance I like, you don't want a very deep di distance here because the tool can come inside there if you have too far a distance. A angles all set. With those two settings, my fingernail here and this locked so it never changes, I can sharpen most of my tools. And with that same idea, the bar that comes with it, which is way too long, but you will notice I have these lines on it. My roughing gouge is here, bowl gouge is there, the spindle gouge is here. So basically, whenever I want to do a spindle gouge, I bring this up, I drop my finger on that line, and my settings are always the same. Now, if for some reason you ever need to change those settings because I use a Sharpie, just a little alcohol will take it right off. 
and because my spindle gouge I have the settings I like, might not be perfect for everybody, but they are ones I like. I bought one of these just for my spindle gouge, and I haven't changed this setting in probably eight years. I drop it in, I drop my tool in there, I'm ready to go. I have one also set for an old bowl gouge uh, angle, but I prefer to do my bowl gouge now on the platform instead of on this tool. And the final kind of luxury thing I have is these were made by Thompson's. I picked them up at SWAT one year. Dad picked up a set too. It's just a hole to a certain depth. So if you ever need to uh, set up the jigs, you kind of drop this, drop your tool into the hole, and then this bumps up. And I'll show you how to do that later. You could do the same thing by just screwing a block on the corner of your table, and that would bump up to that. It's just, it's, it's a, it's a knickknack. Now, I know this sounds like I'm nickel and diming up a fairly expensive setup, but I want you to think about it. Grinders don't go bad very often. You can pick up a used one at a pawn shop, a garage sale, or something like that, and let's say you pay just half what a brand new one was. These are readily available throughout the year at sales at a lot of woodworking stores for about $100. And they will come with generally an 80 grit and a 120 grit friable wheel. I turned on those two wheels for over a decade and never replaced them. That's how little you're want grinding them away, even turning as much as I do. Uh, they did get smaller, but not that big a deal. In fact, uh, that's one of the wheels that originally came on this that I've been using this whole time. So there's 50 bucks. Add $100 to get a Wolverine setup, which includes the two sides, the platform, and the arm. And you can do most everything. You can make little homemade jigs to compensate for this right here if you don't want to spend the extra 60 bucks. You can make little plywood setups for these kind of things right here. It's all out there. There's lots of information on the internet on how to build that stuff. Upgrading to diamond wheels means there's less of that abrasive in the air when you're grinding. It's a lot, lot cleaner, especially if you do stuff like put a magnet inside a little baggie and put it up underneath your platform or leave it down here. It kind of collects all the metal shavings, makes it very easy to uh, keep clean. Uh, plus there's less chance of them exploding. So that's why you have those guards on it. Uh, but that's something you can purchase way down the road after you've sold enough bowls to justify it. But that's enough about the equipment. Now let's actually get to sharpening. So here are the tools I'm going to discuss sharpening today. We're going to start out with a spindle roughing gouge. Then we're going to go to a spindle gouge. I'm going to be sharpening this with a more difficult fingernail grind. Then we're going to do two bowl gouges. One, I'm going to do at what they now call a 40-40 grind. Some people might call it L, uh, a variation of an Ellsworth or a variation of a swept or Irish. Or they're all, the technique will be for the same for all of those. And then we're going to do one that's uh, kind of a conventional bowl gouge. Uh, a lot of people call it a bottom feeder nowadays. I'm then going to work on a parting tool, a skew, but I'm going to do it in a the harder method, not the straight one, the one that offers both a straight and a curve, popularized uh, nowadays by uh, Richard by uh, Alan Lacer. And then we're going to do two bowl uh, scrapers, one conventional, one with a negative rake. And you can take that information on the scrapers and apply it to the other shapes of scrapers. So let's get working on a spindle roughing gouge. So to sharpen it, I'm gonna start out by putting my 40 degree platform on. And once again, I just put my finger down on the line and I bring it forward and I know it's going to be at 40 degrees. No matter what wheel I do it, because the, pla the part it's sliding into is exactly the same on both wheels. It's lined up with the face of the wheel itself. Now, I recently built me a new roughing, spindle roughing gouge, but I'm going to go back to my old one just so that I can show you what happens as you, as you sharpen them over time. So here's basically how I would sharpen this tool. I would come over to my gouge, set this up, come over here. I'm going to focus on keeping this lined up with the wheel itself. That keeps me at a perfect 90 degrees, and this is how long it takes. Come over.
And really, I, I'm gonna go a little bit longer to get rid of the last little bit right there, okay? And that just might be because this platform, when I reset it, was maybe a degree off. Okay. Now, if you want to, my dad advocates for using a Sharpie on your grinders because it really does illustrate what you're taking off. Me personally, I can, I think you can kind of see it visually. So right there, I could come over here, I could touch it and see if the angle is right. Okay, so notice I'm touching down a little bit low. If I wanted to increase this angle a little bit with these platforms, what you do is they are hinged in the middle. So I, if I come over here and I tap on the top, it steepened up the angle a little bit and I can come back over and just touch it down a little bit and check it again. Oh, that line almost goes all the way to the top. So fine adjustment. Let's see how this one does. Just a nice touch. And now I'm touching right in the middle. So now I can go ahead and grind the rest of the way. And it repeats whatever I have set on the gouge itself. Again, normally, because I've had this set and I've never touched it, my sharpening is this much. Touch, go across, back, get back to work. But here's what happens. Go let the wheel wind down. Nobody's perfect, and over time, sometimes you might grind a little bit too more in the middle than do the wing. So over the course of maybe a dozen sharpenings, this will come down farther. What you actually want with a spindle roughing gouge is for it to be perfectly parallel this way and this way. So sometimes it might come back a little bit like that, it might come back a little bit like that, or maybe it's canted one way or the other. Here's how you can reset it. And I'm gonna use this as an example to show you how you can reset all of your gouges. I can take a board with a piece of sandpaper or a grinding stone and just go at it at 90 degrees until I get it to the shape I want, okay? That's obviously going to be wearing this down a little bit, but you can just go like that. Or if you have a grinding wheel designed so that you can push it sideways, fry bowl wheels you can't, I can come over here, get it at perfect 90 degrees and just lightly touch it. See, it's, going, it's touching on that side, not that side, a little bit. So there we go, notice the shine. So now all I have to do is go back to that same grinding wheel I was at and keep grinding until that little flat goes away and I'll end up with a perfectly shaped spindle rough and gouge. Now one really cool thing about the CBN wheels is they're metal wheels. They act as a heat sink in, in to themselves. I can sit here and grind like this for quite a bit of time without it getting too hot. Notice my finger is still touching it. I am not burning myself, okay? It's a little warm, but not that bad. If you're using a friable wheel, all the heat is getting put into the steel, not the wheel itself. So you might need something to cool it off a little bit. But high-speed steel can get way hot, well beyond it turning colors before it's gonna lose its temper. So you don't really have to worry that much about it. Now, if you don't want to use the platform in this setting, you can do this with the bar. Remember me talking about putting those lines on this bar? Well, I have one of the lines for this particular roughing gouge. So I can now just slide it in, place my finger on my roughing gouge line, come forward, and then tighten it up. And because it is a flat grind, I can basically just drop this in the wheel and come over here and touch it down and grind it this way. And it'll make it a perfect shape, ready to rock and roll.
Next up is my parting gouge, and this is about as cheap as they come. It's not even a diamond parting gouge. To sharpen this one, it is as simple as turning your grinder on. I have the same 40 degree platform set up, no changes there. I'll come over here once again, lining the side up with the wheel. Keeping those in line, make sure that you get a nice 90 degree edge on the top. And it's just a simple touch here, touch here. And then the last side that you touched is the one where the burr is coming back up. So I will actually work the tool this way because that's the sharper side and that becomes my edge. As I'm turning, if I know that this side is pretty flat, a lot of times all I will do is come over here, touch that side and get back to work. Only, you, only grind on one side if you need to, if that's all you need to do. Occasionally the side gets like varnish or a sap on there or something like that or just burn marks So I will take a little Abrasive platform a piece of sandpaper works just fine and I will do the sides like this But that's maybe once every 20 grindings No big deal and you can see it cleans up pretty nicely Next up is my spindle roughing gouge. This is my go-to tool in top making. In late last few years, you know, I burned through one or two of these a year. That's how much I use it. And this is my normal sharpening regime for it. But I want you to notice something. Mine's actually a little bit messed up right now. Can you see this right here is a grinding point on the side on this side and if I come straight over it's a little bit off so this is not balanced now sometimes you will get where I get a little scoop they call that like a hook or something like that and that can make it very catchy or it might be proud what we want is this to be very flat all the way across so an easy way to reset that is to come over put it so that the flute sits on your platform and just touch it what will happen is you'll get the slightest of you going all the way across of the flats. I exaggerated it right there for y'all's benefit. Normally I wouldn't do that much, but you can see I've got to remove a lot more on this side and the toe than on this side. So I'll keep going. What it's Hear that? I'm flat, so it's going to be balanced, and I'm just kind of touching and raising it up. There we go. So in my sharpening, to get it perfectly balanced, I just need to remove those flats. So to set up for that sharpening, that tool, I'm going to use a jig, and then I'm going to show you how you can freehand it without the jig. So I'm just going to move this over here to my finer platform. This is where it pretty much stays all the time. Then I'm going to grab the bar, which I have a mark for my spindle gouge. Fingernail goes on the line and it goes straight into the slot. Lock it down. Then I will reach over, I grab the uh, Varigrind jig that I've got set up for my spindle. I basically drop it in and I have a Thompson setup jig for two inches. Basically, I'm just gonna set the protrusion from the edge two inches. No big deal, you can do that with a piece of wood if you want to. And now I just drop that in here and that's all it takes to do the grinding. But something you need to take into account when you're doing any kind of gouge, whether it's a bowl or a spindle gouge, there is more metal in the middle than on the sides. So as you are bringing it from one side to the other, if you're maintaining speed and pressure, well, more material get removed from the side than the, cent the center section. So a lot of times what you'll see me do is I will start on one side and if I'm removing a lot of material, I'll make even passes, but each time I go around, it might be smaller and smaller and smaller and then I will come back and go bigger and bigger and bigger and that just removes more middle down the center 
or spends more time on the center than the sides to hopefully even it out. But normally when I'm sharpening, I will come over here, it'll be a light touch fast, I'll slow down and then speed up and then that's it. Here is a normal round of me sharpening this one if I wasn't having to remove that flap. I would come over here, turn it on, let it speed up. Drop it in, light touch, heavier, light touch, heavier, and then get back to work. But right now my objective is to reshape this tool. So I've got to remove more on this side than that side. So I'll just sit here and watch it. I'll sit here, grind on it, and then take a look. And as soon as that flat spot is gone, I know I've got the shape I want and it'll be sharp at that time. A little bit more of a flat right on the nose. Now can you see, as the light reflects around it, there's a little bit of shine right on that tip tip of the nose. That's where the light's right there. Can you see that? So I just need to remove a little bit more metal right there to get the perfect shape. And there we go. Now you cannot see the edge at all. So I, I've got a very sharp tool. But Look at that bevel on the back side. See how large it is? That will get in the way. So a lot of times I will remove that bevel and I don't really care if it looks perfectly. How I will do that one is I will simply raise it up here and I'll work it in a kind of a U. Starting on the side and coming down towards the middle and then coming back up the side. And this is good practice for freehand sharpening a spindle gouge because this is the exact pattern you use. You see what's happening? I'm wearing away that heel on the back of that gouge, getting it away, getting rid of it. Slowly making that bevel shorter and shorter. Now, if you don't want to use that jig or setup, you can use this 40 degree platform to do that same exact thing. What I'm going, basically what I would do is I will use my finger on it. I won't change the platform. And then I'm going to come over here and I will come down until I can see that the tip is touching the, the, the grinder stone. So that tells me that's the bottom of, of my U. So I will come up and do this exact same thing, making that U coming up the sides to make that shape. Now, if you don't want to risk doing it with the grinder on, this is where using a marker will be a good benefit for you. So you just mark up the tip like that. And then you can come over here and if you want to see if you've got it just right, just move the gouge sideways and look. Oh, I'm not touching the tip yet. So I can come down a little bit farther. There we go. I got a full line right there. So I know that this right here is my bottom portion. So now I can just turn the thing on, come up. Right like that. And when you got all the black removed, you got a pretty good gouge. When you're doing that, the key thing you don't want to do though is stop and keep going. That will give you a lot of bevels. You want to try to make it a very smooth turn all the way around so you get the smooth bevel all the way around.
Sean? Are you are you showing them your gout the way you do it? My my shape, yeah. Yeah, well, I I don't really like your shape that well. That didn't work for me. Let me show show mine. It's, it's much better. Sean, this this is your angle right there. It is extremely steep, and I end up needing to get more detail with my spindle gouts because I don't use the skew as much as you do. So I'm doing, uh, let me show you a different way of doing it. There is my spindle gouge. I don't worry too much about having a uniform U, but it's got a, a very steep angle on it that I like. The way I end up doing it is I'll blacken it like Sean does, cause he got that for me. Hey. And then I come up and use the same 40-40 rest. He is like me messing with his rest. And I'll rest my hand here and, and I'll just guide it and then I'll just work it till I get that angle I want. Basically, I'm looking just to remove the, the point at the edge and get what I want. So I'm just gonna move it up and around. And I'll look at it and I'll see all right on one side, but I'm not on the other. So I'll come back in and take it out. And that's my spindle gouge. Wait a second, Dad, are you actually telling them not to go fully 90 degrees? You're just kind of scooping a little bit on the side? I guess so, because all I'm cutting, you know, I'm just cutting on the edge. I don't go all the way up. I don't have to. At least I don't. I could, I guess. I could go all the way up like that, but I don't. But I could. It'd be just as easy. You can see I have the same profile on my two smaller gouges. I use this one a whole lot. And this one's for the very fine work. And it's just got a similar grind to it. And they're, and they're, they're made the same way. I will blacken it first so I know where I'm at. Then I'll come in and look at it and, and I'll also be taking off my heel, but I'll bring it down just to where I can know it's gonna be cutting it and I can sort of see it cut. And I can see how I'm getting close. There it is, and I don't have it on the top yet. Not quite, you see a little bit still left there. And I'll take that heel off if I want it. Now I've, now I've got something I can get in and get some really nice detail with. Now, since I had the 40 degree set up, let's go ahead and sharpen a bowl gout. And I'll start out doing it freehand so you don't have to buy any more jigs. And this is actually the preferred way for the bowl gouge. A spindle gouge, because of the shape of the, flu shape of the floop, you can get an even angle at every single point if you set your jig up, jig up okay. But with a bowl gouge, because it's a, I don't know what they call it, a parabola or something like that, it's got straight sides and then it scoops underneath and then it straight sides out. A, a jig that gives you a very even flow all the way around will not give you a consistent angle because of those flats on the side. So actually doing it freehand will give you better results. And I found that with about two days of practice of turning with this gouge because you're sharpening so often when you're doing bowl gouges, you get a lot of practice and it ends up being easier than setting up the jig. So here's my bowl gouge. As you can see, if you look down the flute, the sides are somewhat straight and then it's got a curve on bottom, okay? Also notice that the shape here is slightly rounded, if not straight. What you don't want it to do is be concave like that, because that would be very catchy and you won't get very good results. It either needs to be convex 
or completely straight. And once again, to get that, you can use the two wings on your platform, come back up and touch it. And with the 40-40 grind, basically what that's saying is you have a 40 degree angle here and a 40 degree angle all the way around here. So to get the perfect shape, just put it flat, see right there, and then come up to get that perfect U, just like that. If you're not going to be doing a, a con K, convex curve, just touch it and come back. If you're wanting a little bit more convex, just kind of touch and rise a little bit and come back down. Now to get the 40-40 grind, we want to take that flat wing right there and get it horizontal to the ground. And what I would do is I would just put pressure in the middle of the wing and set it down. Now on my platform, this is set to 40 degrees to the wheel, but you also see these lines right here. Those are 40 degrees either side. So if I can get this wing parallel with the ground and at that angle, then I know these side angles will be at 40 degrees. So all I have to do is keep it parallel with that line on the platform and come across a little bit. If I want to add a little bit of curve, I will kind of move it on this side or that side of that line and then swing it down to the middle so that when I'm straight up and down at the middle, this is completely open, parallel with the platform, at which time I will come back over to the other side, making sure that this is flat, move it back and forth or swing it a tad bit and then swing down. So this is how long it takes to do. Turn it on, let it ramp up to speed, come over, I'm putting weight on the bottom wing. Line it up. And then rock that little center section a little bit. And there we go. Okay? Nice edge. Now what you're actually looking for is a very consistent bevel coming around the side over here. About a millimeter's worth, consistent all the way around. All this stuff right here doesn't really matter. You can have as multiple facets as you want right there. You just want one consistent facet about a millimeter down all the way around, okay? All this is doing is getting rid of the heel out of the way so you can make a smooth cut around corners. But if you're wanting a grind that I would say is maybe 90% as effective as that, but a lot easier to control for probably a brand new beginner, I'm talking somebody who's been at it a month or two, don't be ashamed of using these grinding jigs because I did it for years and I guarantee you the bowls don't know the difference. It's as simple as dropping it in again, going to set your parameter and then remember me talking about those lines on that bar well i have a line for this bowl gouge right there on the other side and the action is exactly the same as with the spindle gouge start on the wing come to the nose, probably spend a little bit more time on the nose because there's a little bit more meat there for you to remove and then come back over. And you'll get, again, 90, 95% the quality of the grind that you will do freehand. Now that was a bowl gouge with swept back wings. A more traditional gouge does not have wings that are swept back as much. A lot of people nowadays call this a bottom feeder gouge because basically this is the bowl, the bowl gouge you use for the very bottoms of the bowl. That other one is better for the sides of a bowl. And well, what do you know? The traditional angle is 40 degrees. So you don't even have to reset your platform. Just come over here. And this is a lot more like when you were doing the spindle roughing gouge. It's just kind of a twisting motion with a slight swing, not much at all. There you go.
This time let's talk about a bowl gouge, specifically a negative rake bowl gouge. And that's where you actually grind on both sides so you get a little bit sharper of an edge right here. And on this tool, you basically only grind the bottom most of the time so that the burr forms on the top side. But I'm gonna show you how to do both of them. And well, what do you know? In my example, yeah, the, the, the angles aren't perfect, but for some reason, I've already got a 40 degree platform set up here why change it? So what I would do is I would start on the side, way down here, almost to the point, notice my handle is almost horizontal, and I'll start working it. And basically, as I come around the curve, I'm trying to keep that curve perpendicular to the grind. So here we go. And that right there is all I really ever do when I'm um, putting a fresh burr on this tool right here. It's that fast. Now occasionally you might want to grind the top and you do that exactly the same way, except this time the handle is going the other way and it's just, you know, kind of keep it parallel to the grinder. Now, a lot of people when they do their curves, they like to end up perpendicular to this edge right here. Me personally, I like to bring it back ever so slightly because it allows me to go both directions. But now that you've done the top, you always have to go back and do the bottom because right now the burr is going the wrong way so it's not going to cut. You have to have the burr coming up, which means the last step before you actually go to your, your bowl is to put the burr on bottom. And you can feel it, it'll be there. Now one of the big differences between negative rake, see with that edge on both sides, and a classic or traditional grinder is the angle. Can you see the difference? This one's set to 40, this one's much steeper. Well, this is where I know I'm a bit spoiled. If you remember way back in the beginning, I told you dad worked with one grinder where he had two diamond wheels and I worked with two because I really liked having my platform set where I didn't have to move them. So one grinder I had set with 40 degrees and the other grinder I had set when I was doing bowls or boxes for this tool right here. And basically, Think about it. My negative rake scraper, my bowl gouge, my spindle gouge could all be done here. And then whenever I wanted to sharpen this tool, it was as fast as this. I'm back to work. The motion is the same, but I'm not coming back as far with this tool. I'm basically coming over to just that one point right there. So I come back, pressure down to keep it flat, and come back over. Boom, just like that to get that nice edge. Now you might notice I have these bevels right here. Because I do small boxes so often, this is a pretty huge heel for when you're turning inside. This will actually, if the box is rolling around, a lot of times it will hit this portion. So I like to get rid of that. So I will do that one by starting flat like this, and I don't really care what the angle is, and I will roll up. Just like that. Once again, it doesn't matter the angle, it's just getting rid of the metal around that corner. Real easy. Start, roll. Finally, let's talk about the skew. Now, it's kind of funny. You seem to either be bowl turning or spindle turning, which means you're using tools like those bowl scrapers or the skew. So, this platform right here, I change all the time. You know, I'll set it up for that uh, bowl uh, scraper or I set it up for the skew, but this one, the 40 degree one, I never touch. Also, I gotta admit that I don't grind this tool as often as I do my other tools. 
This is the one tool that I will hone with a little slip stone. I'll show you that in a second. But I've got to establish these angles. And you can cut straight off the grinder, but I find it's easy to refine this uh, with that slip stone simply because of the large bevel. Now the general rule of thumb is, well, I have no clue what the actual angle is here on, on these two angles coming down. Is that in focus somewhat? Okay, but the general rule of thumb is you take this width of whatever your blade is and that corner to corner distance is one and a half times the width and that will get you the angle you want. Basically, I said it once when I first got the gal, the skew, and I will probably sharpen this for its entire life without ever really verifying the angle again. But whenever I want to set it on this platform, I'll loosen all the settings, and then I will actually set my angle off of the tool. And again, you set it once at the beginning of the day, and then you just leave it for the day. Now, if you're setting your gouge up traditionally, basically you would have a 70 degree angle from that tip to that point right here. You will notice that mine is not quite a consistent curve. It's basically somewhat straight for about one third right there, and then it begins to curve right here. But if you connect the dot there to the dot there, it does come out to 70 degrees, or actually I should say about there where the straight stops and down here. Now. Uh, this I got this idea from a gentleman named Alan Lacer who really advocates it for it But his particular design is he goes completely Perpendicular to the side Across about a third and then curves it down. You'll notice mine comes mine's not quite that extreme But I prefer it this way and everybody's going to eventually come up with a grind that they kind of like So I've got it painted on this side I set my angle and I'm going to start at the angle that's going to be straight across right here, which mine is not quite parallel, it's slightly off. And then I can come over here and just kind of move it back and forth to verify that I got the platform in the right spot. And when I do, it'll grind away the metal in the middle. To make adjustments, I either tap on top to lower it one way or I tap on bottom to lower it the other. And I just keep going until I get the angle so it's taking away shavings in the dead center instead of one end or the other. See, when I started out, it was removing the ink on the bottom, then it removed it on the top, and now as I tap it down a little bit more, it might be removing all the way across. I'm pretty happy with that. It's touching down there and there at the same time. So now I am going to place it and I've got a pivot point right about here. So I'm going to move it straight across and then I'm going to pivot around that point with my hand. Come over, pressing down hard here, my middle finger at my pivot point. And then do the same exact thing on the other side. Whoops, wasn't quite taking it all the way up to the tip, so tap it on the bottom, top. Voila, a little bit more right up there. Then do the same exact thing, opposite angles on the other side. I now have a very sharp skew. And this skew straight off the grinder is okay. I mean, I know a lot of people that that's what they'll do. They'll work over here, they'll come over here. I personally will somewhat hone. I won't hone it right now, but after it dulls a little bit, I'll use this stone right here. And I've done a video on this in the past and I'll kind of rock it, find the angle, and then just kind of, I'm rocking off the bottom bevel and every now and then it touches the top one. That way I, I keep it straight. 
and this keeps me sharp, sharp all day long. I very rarely grind my skews. But the one thing that even if you don't want to hone in like that, you want to take some kind of abrasive and on that top tip, go flat and really sharpen that up because you'll use that top tip quite a bit in V cuts and stuff like that, just to clean that up. Well, I did tell you these Tool Fool Fridays were a deep dive into one tool. This time it was a grinder specifically for turners because I really don't know how I could do this hobby or make a living at this without the grinder. And I think I showed you that it really isn't that hard. The skills you use to sharpen are the same exact skills you use to turn. So your turning practice is sharpening practice. And if you think back on what I actually showed you to sharpen, what did I do? I got one platform I set to 40 degrees. If it was 41, 42, 43, or 47, it doesn't really matter as long as it's consistent and I don't touch it, I'll be happy. I won't be able to tell the difference. And I use that for so many different tools. The other side, I changed up a little bit. I might have had a different platform or a different setting for you know my scrapers or my skew. Or maybe I put the bar in there and used a jig for my spindle gouge, which if I didn't have that Veragrind jig, I could have just used the 40 degree platform, used my fingers as a fence and moved up there. You can get it all done, all the basic tools with the base Wolverine jig and a grinder. Well, I hope you enjoyed this video. Got a few tips, techniques, maybe a willingness to get out there and try. But in the end, I really just want you to remember that it's always worth the effort to learn, create stuff, and share it with others. Y'all be safe and have fun.